Hello everyone and welcome back to Turning the Table. Today we are looking at Bloodborne the card game, not to be confused with Bloodborne the board game or Bloodborne the video game. No, this is a much lighter experience for 3 to 5 players. In this video we're going to look at how the game works, the components, the good and the bad, and as always I'll try to answer the question, is this game for you? I will also be discussing the Hunter's Nightmare expansion later in the review, as I believe it is an important addition to this game. I'll pop a timestamp down the bottom for that as well. In Bloodborne the card game, each player is a hunter, killing monsters and collecting blood echoes as you deal damage. But this is no standard boss battler. It includes some strong social deception elements, and you'll need to predict your opponent's intentions and hide your own to come out on top. Note that what follows is not a comprehensive rules guide, but rather an overview of the key mechanics. At the start of the game, a final boss is selected. This is the last monster you will fight, but it also has an effect that permeates each round of the entire game. You will then construct a deck of 10 monster cards randomly, three of which will be boss monsters. Not to be confused with the final boss, which is an oversized card. Players are given a board to track their trophies and blood echoes as they kill monsters, along with the same 5 cards as everyone else. Two melee weapons, a ranged weapon, a transform card, and a hunter's dream card. An upgrade deck is shuffled, and a row of 5 cards are drawn from it. Players set their health dials to 8, a reserve of blood is placed in the middle of the table, someone is randomly given the first player marker, and the first monster is revealed from the monster deck, and then you're good to go. Each player must choose and play an action card from their hand, and these cards are revealed simultaneously, but generally resolved in turn order, starting with the player with the first player marker. Now if any player used a transform card, this now takes effect, and they choose to play a melee or a ranged weapon. If multiple players do this, then all of these cards are also revealed simultaneously. Transform cards are powerful because you get to see what everyone else is doing before committing to a decision, and this gives you a distinct advantage. Then any cards with an instant effect are resolved. This is the only way players get to act before the monster has a chance to attack. The monster then strikes and deals damage to players based on a dice roll. The more dangerous a monster, the more dangerous the dice, as represented by the green, yellow, and red symbols. Sometimes, monsters can deal a ludicrous amount of damage, as these plus symbols mean the monster gets to do a follow-up roll in addition to the damage shown. Then, finally the hunters get to attack by resolving all of the non-instant effect cards that they revealed earlier, provided of course that they are still alive. Players always receive blood echoes based on the damage that they dealt, and if the monster is killed, then the players that contributed are awarded trophies, which will provide a bonus score at the end of the game. If the monster survives, it does escape, however, and the players have lost their opportunity to gain any more blood echoes or trophies from that creature. Boss monsters, however, never escape. They persist round after round until they are killed. Finally, any hunter that played the Hunter's Dream card gets to act. They reclaim all of their used action cards from the discard pile and return them to their hand. They take all of their unbanked blood echoes and place them in the banked section. This means that that score is locked in and can't be lost. And then they have the opportunity to take an upgrade card from the row in the middle before replacing that card from the top of the deck. And then they finally restore to full health. Now, not all hunters will necessarily make it through a round, so players that are killed skip to this step, essentially losing their opportunity to damage the monster. Death is very costly, in that any unbanked blood echoes are lost completely, however dead hunters do come back during the hunter's dream step, and as a consolation prize they also get to take an upgrade card and restore to full health, but they do not recover their spent cards from their discard pile. Finally, the first player token is moved to the left, and a new monster is revealed, and blood echoes are placed on that monster equal to its health. And then there's an extra one for each player above 3 in the game. This structure repeats until the monster deck is exhausted, and then the players face the final boss, which mechanically behaves the same as any other. Once the final boss is defeated, players total up their banked and unbanked blood echoes along with any points received from their trophies, and the winner with the most points is declared. Let's look at a quick example of play. Today I'm being assisted by Pocopino and Ollie, who I have borrowed from my dog. Here comes the first monster, a Scourge Beast. 
This is a nasty one, and it has a when revealed ability that deals two damage to each of us. We adjust our health dials appropriately. With a three player game, it comes into play with six blood echoes. Ollie, Porcupino, and I agree that if all of our hunters use our axe cards, which deal two damage each, we will finish it off before it escapes. We place our cards face down and reveal them simultaneously. Because I am very trustworthy, I have played my axe. However, Porcupino has been sneaky and he's played his hunter's dream, probably because he has an eye on that very juicy Kirkhammer in the upgrade row. Ollie is much less trusting than me and he has opted to play Transform. Seeing that we will not have enough damage to kill the monster, he opts to switch into his Saw Cleaver, which deals less damage, thus saving his higher damage axe for a later round. There are no instant effects in this round, so the monster then attacks. It rolls dangerously well, but we manage to scrape through. Pocopino is fine of course, because Hunter's Dream means that he takes half damage this round. Finally, our attacks resolve in player order, so starting with me, I deal my 2 damage, and I get 2 blood echoes. Ollie deals his damage, and then he will get 1 blood echo for his saw cleaver, and then Pocupino deals no damage at all as he is dreaming. The monster then escapes because we haven't killed it, and in the hunter's dream step, Pocupino gets to select an upgrade, add his played card back to his hand, and he also heals to full health. So he is well prepared for the next round, however he doesn't have any score yet. To be fair, my score is also rather precarious, because on low health I have to survive until I play Hunter's Dream, or I'll lose those unbanked echoes. The next monster is then revealed, I pass on the first player token, and we go again. And that is how you play. So it is component time! Bloodborne the card game is a compact game in a compact box. The insert fits everything very easily, but it will move around if not stored the right way up, and you can't really put this on its side without components going everywhere. The player boards are thick card, there are plenty of flavoursome blood echoes, the first player token is a standee so it's nice and obvious, there are three custom dice for monster damage, tokens to track trophies, the five health dials, which I kind of wish had somehow been incorporated into the player board, and then the cards themselves. Five large final boss cards, 7 boss cards, 18 monster cards, 32 upgrade cards, and of course, 25 starting hand cards, that's 5 for each potential player. The quality here is not poor, but it's nothing to write home about either, it's perfectly serviceable, there are very few frills or standout pieces of design or art, but at the same time, nothing feels overly flimsy, cheap, or out of place. The rule book is very clear, it steps out everything with good examples, it tells you what each symbol or type of card does at the most logical point that it should, and it makes the game a breeze to pick up and play. There are some more complex rules interactions that show up occasionally, but the rulebook covers these as well. So how does it all come together? Well there are a number of things in Bloodborne the card game that make it very nice to play. It is light, it's easy to pick up, the meat here isn't so much around deeply tactical decision making, but instead around predicting and exploiting what it is that other players at the table are going to do. Saying that you'll do one thing, and then doing another. Counting what cards your opponent still has in their hand so you can be prepared for the range of things they might pull out, and then making decisions based on that information. As players get more and more upgrade cards added to their hand, the complexity increases slowly, and by the end, people generally have built up a bit of an engine. Some cards do massive damage, others protect you from harm, and some enable you to do collateral damage to other hunters, accelerating their demise if timed correctly, and it can cause them to lose a huge amount of score. Playing that fire sprayer and finishing off a player with a lot of blood echoes waiting to bank is very satisfying, if indeed a little bit cruel. Bloodborne also plays fast. It sets up fast, as long as you have all of the cards sorted prior to each play, and it's the kind of game that we often say, another round to, when we get to the end. The other element that I like about Bloodborne the card game is how it deals with luck. Now I don't usually like hefty helpings of randomness, and don't get me wrong, with those monster damage dice the game does have its fair share, but there are a few mitigating factors. At its core, Bloodborne is about managing risk. The more aggressive you are in pursuit of blood echoes, the harder it becomes to bank them safely, the longer you'll have to go without playing Hunter's Dream. 
By playing it safe, you may avoid damage and heal often and get plenty of upgrades, but it reduces your ability to actually accumulate score because you're attacking less. Balancing this risk comes down to your assessment of how much health you have, how many cards other players have that might hurt you, and of course, the severity of the monster's dice roll. Importantly, all players generally take the same damage from the boss, so this means you'll not be singled out with a wild roll either. It combines hand building, social elements, boss battling mechanics, and a core push your luck engine to make a really successful game, and one that emulates the central idea that death will come often, but it still feels punishing. The ability to heal and upgrade cards upon death, along with the lack of any sort of elimination, makes it a fun party game as well. There is, of course, a flip side, and Bloodborne does suffer from a bit of an identity crisis. This IP is associated with a hardcore deep experience, and the card game simply does not offer this. Rather, it is much closer to a light party game. This doesn't mean that the theme is at odds with the mechanics, it's just that it might take a minute to explain to someone in their first game that despite the fact that everyone is a hunter killing monsters, no one actually cares if the monsters die as long as they come out with the most score. Now sure, that may involve dealing damage to monsters, but this is in no way a cooperative game. No one is working together, and any semblance that someone might want to is either a manipulation or outright naivety. Is this a good thing? A bad thing? Well, I suppose that's up to you. My biggest complaint, however, is that the game is actually pretty light when it comes to content, with only a small selection of monsters, especially the big bosses, and you'll start to see them repeating quite often after a few games. What's worse is that the upgrade cards are not exactly expansive in the range of different abilities that they offer, and you may feel like after three or four plays, you've seen it all, and you're not really able to dive into making interesting and targeted builds with your hand. Now there is a solution to this. The Hunter's Nightmare expansion really does solve this problem, and it's both a wonderful and a disappointing thing when an expansion fixes issues with the base game, it's wonderful that it does it, and it's disappointing here that it's probably needed. So this expansion provides a whopping 38 new Hunter upgrade cards, 8 more large final boss cards, 8 more bosses, and 17 standard monsters. So this just about doubles the content of the base game, and the best thing is, it still fits in the box. You can squeeze it all in there. It's not going to fit super well, but it does fit. This not only fixes any replayability issues that I may have had, but the Hunter upgrade cards in particular are designed to greatly increase the amount of player-to-player -player interactivity, and this is always a good thing in my book. There are more ways to steal from players, damage players, protect yourself from players. The whole works. In addition to the content, the expansion adds two new mechanics. A death token system caps the amount of trophies that you can get more and more after each time that you die, making death more costly, and moving the game slightly towards a more hardcore setting. The best upgrade though is the rune cards. Now these are selected at the start of a game, and they give you a unique ability like increased melee damage at the cost of being vulnerable when you use a melee attack card. Now this allows you to create specific builds when you select your upgrade cards, and it also keeps things fresh as you try out different combinations of hands with different runes. So with all this in mind, is Bloodborne the card game for you? Well, by itself, it's a serviceable game. The mechanics are solid, it's fun to play, but it does tend to run out of steam pretty quickly. Once you add on the expansion, there are a lot of issues that are fixed, but that does involve getting the expansion, which is certainly a bigger investment for a light game. Bloodborne is not the first game I reach for on game night, and it's certainly not a game that I invite people over to play specifically or pull out as a main event, but it still often sees use, either when we're winding down, warming up, or we want something light to play while having a drink that's still kind of more flavoursome than some of those other party card games out there. If you really like Bloodborne the video game or other media, this game certainly isn't a cheap tie-in, it does have something to offer. If you're looking for a light party game where you can screw over your friends, then this takes a great angle on that genre, but there are a lot of things out there in that category that probably already satisfy. And of course, if you want a deep, immersive strategy experience, well, you're looking at the wrong Bloodborne. I hope you back to that Kickstarter, because that thing is a monster. And that just about wraps it up. 
Let me know what you think in the comments below and please consider liking and subscribing. It's been really fun putting these videos together each week and I wouldn't want you to miss out. This is Merrick, I'll catch you next time.